I've just been bird watching, dare I say it, here in the studio. Our goal today is to talk a little bit about wetland habitat. So these trusty binoculars are the perfect companion for me. I do have friends. I, I really do. But these are great too. Uh, for those of you that are like, who is this person? My name is Jen. I am part of our education department. Joining me today is a lovely team. Uh, we have James who's going to be bird watching along with me. Ah, oh, yeah. Told you it's really beautiful here. And then we also have Sarah too that's going to be um, bringing the questions in. So um, as we go on ahead and we talk about wetlands today, if you do happen to have any questions about this glorious habitat that we will be discussing, please go on ahead and make sure that you text them to our number right down here. You can text it to 562-286-1838. Uh, currently, I don't remember the date, but it is one o'clock on a Thursday, I do believe. Um, and so if it is not on the 9th, 11th. 11th, just kidding, 11th, uh, <laughs> at 1 o'clock till about 1.30ish, you have missed your window for an opportunity to ask a live question. But not to fret, because we do uh, offer our support and are able to answer your questions by utilizing the, the email down below at live at lbaop.org. But in the meantime, if you do happen to be watching live, uh, then hopefully you will be inspired to check out some wetlands of your very own, either near or far, uh, either walking distance, or maybe just checking them out via webcam. So let's go ahead, let's get started. Here we have a lovely, um, a lovely wetland. Oh, and by the way, if you do have any questions, just make sure that texting rates do apply. Uh, and if you are uh, a younger viewer, please make sure that you get your parents' permission ahead of time. But as we go on ahead and we check out this habitat here, what are some things that you notice? This is a wetland, right? So think about maybe that word in general. And what do you, what do you notice? What do, what do you see? Well, for me, I can see there's land. I can see it's wet, right? So it's kind of handy. A wetland, wetland, right? Uh, very much lots of water, and there's also some land available. Now on this land, does it seem more sandy? Does it seem more grassy? What do you notice? Well, I can notice around me that it definitely is kind of grassy, right? It's not just like the super short grass, but it's actually kind of tall grasses. And in the very back too, I go on ahead and I notice that there's some taller trees as well, right? So here we have a really nice, almost like pristine view of, of one of the actually very few habitats that still exist here, at least in California. Um, but definitely within the United States as a whole, we don't have as many of these wetlands as we used to. And we'll get into that a little bit. But our goal today is to really focus on this habitat right here. What are some of its overall characteristics, right? What are, what are its kind of like, you know, quintessential features? Like wet and land are definitely some of those. But we'll go on ahead and get into a little deeper about how this wetland really provides what I like to call kind of like an ecosystem service, right? So this is basically how does this habitat help our animals to be able to survive? And also, how does it help humans, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well as some of the animals that you might see in the wetlands. We do have a few of them here at the aquarium. And so that's pretty much what we're gonna be talking about here during our wetlands class today. Now, we've got down so far, that is what? That it's land, that there's shrubs, that there's tall grasses, right? Um, and so where do you think you might be able to find these habitats? So they definitely kind of go by like other other names. Wetland is just kind of the overall arching group. Hmm. Maybe whisper it to your your friend, your neighbor, if your neighbor lives really close by, <laughs> to your fish at home. I whisper a lot of things to my cats. Ah, if you said estuary, you are correct. If you said swamp, you are correct, right? Uh, if you said maybe like a marsh. That also works too, right? So many of these areas that we see here, and this is actually right off of San Francisco, I do believe. Yep, James is nodding his head. So San Francisco right here. So you can see it still has that same wetness, that same landness. 
Uh, looks like there might even be some plants that are living inside of that wetness, right? All of that water, that right there. It uh, could be fresh water, could be a mix of fresh and salt. There's definitely some different mixing that happens here. Um, some areas are right where the water of the river leads out into the ocean. So there are a lot of different areas. Or maybe there's lakes, and these lakes have wetlands that surround kind of the outside edges. So there's lots of different versions, but this is just one example here. And it's really cool because you're kind of getting a chance to see a top-down view of, of these uh, beautiful, magnificent habitats, almost like a bird's eye view, if you will. Uh, can you tell our focus is also going to be on birds today? So with that, right, um, any thoughts to why something like this is so important for birds? Well, I can think of maybe food, right? I mean, it looks like there's lots of tasty morsels back here. I could think of some juicy worms to eat, maybe some of the larval insects that live in these streams or these rivers or lakes. Hmm, what else? Maybe some small fish. That could be a tasty treat too. Snails! Snails galore! There are so many snails that live in these habitats. Some of them even will hang out outside of the water a little bit. Hmm. Ooh, seeds, right? Seeds are another great thing. Think about all of these plants that we're seeing right here. Well, I guess that's the water. Maybe more plants over here, right? And so seeds are another tasty, nutritious little packet of deliciousness, right? So I just finished lunch, but yeah, I'm still hungry. Maybe for some sunflower seeds. Not that sunflowers live in these areas, but definitely, right? So tons of different kinds of foods. Some of this food is underneath the water, right? Some of this food might be on land, like some of those seeds. Um, some of them might eat the plants that live on land or in underwater. Some of them might eat the fish that's in there. Others, maybe like the crabs or the snails that really like to live in the mud, right? So there's so many different places that these birds and other animals can really enjoy this wetland habitat. Now, what's really cool is the fact that there is so much food there that it really allows for a lot of really neat adaptations of birds and the way that they feed. And we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, but if we think about these wetlands and their importance too, so we talked about food, right? So they're a great food source for birds as well as some other animals. But these, these areas are not only good for maybe some birds that may be able to live there year round, but they're also great kind of like uh, road trip stops for these birds too. If you've ever been on a road trip, you know, every once in a while, you might need to stop to use the bathroom, grab a snack, maybe stretch out your legs and arms a little bit, right? And so these birds, a lot of them are migratory birds. So they will migrate from one part um, to a very further part, right? Depending upon what part of the world you're from. I'm sure there's a migratory bird somewhere. Um, and so these birds have to fly really long distances and they too might need a break. Now they might not need like a potty break like you or I might, but definitely a snack break and maybe some time to, to take a nap and just relax for a little bit. And so these wetland environments are a really great place for that. Now, not only are they really great for resting, but they're also a really great place to be able to uh, start a family. So if you think about it, all the food, right? All the food that you want. Oh man, do you crave a fish? Do you crave a snail? I mean, pick your, pick your food, right? There's so many different options. And so it's a wonderful place for a lot of young animals to be raised. Now that could be young birds. It also could be young fish uh, that like to live in these kind of murky shallow waters where there's lots of plants everywhere so they can kind of like hide and dart around. Maybe eat a tasty worm from the sand. <laughs> very delicious, right? Or maybe you're a really, really, really cute um, ray pup, like a stingray pup, right? A baby stingray. And maybe you're looking for a really tasty snail or clam or crab that lives in the sand, right? And so it's not only a great stop for or a great place to raise a family if you are a bird, but also maybe if you're any other kind of animal that loves to live in here too, right? So either fish, um, or stingrays, anything along those lines. So great place. But it's also great for humans who, oh, here's a great picture of our stingray right here. So you can see, as we talked about, right, they are bottom feeders and we can see their mouths just right here. And so those mouths 
actually have hard plates inside them that are able to really crunch and crush a lot of those crunchy animals, you know, those clams, um, those maybe there's some mussels, um, some tasty crabs, stuff like that, right? They definitely can use those crushing teeth to be able to, to eat some of those tasty foods. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So it serves a whole bunch of purposes for many of our animals, but it also serves as a purpose for humans too. Now, believe it or not, this is a great way. These are, these are great areas that really kind of act as buffering zones. So um, if we have to buffer, right, we are protecting ourselves from, from things. Uh, and in this case, they are kind of considering as protection from storms. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these swampy areas or these estuaries, these wetlands, are found kind of on the coastal edges. They're also found inland too, but many times are on the coastal edges. Now, if there's any ever really large storm that comes on by um, or a tsunami that really kind of moves and has lots of big waves, well, when those waves hit all of those really tall grasses and all of that land that's in there, a lot of that energy uh, that would have just whoosh, gone onto land actually gets dissipated or that energy gets spread out all over that land and that water. And so it really saves some towns that maybe might live on that water land edge right there. Those estuaries are great for, for protecting us from those kinds of storms and all that energy. Now, wetlands are also really great for filtering pollution. They are like really large sponges and really large filters. So for us, right, on our, on our streets, at least here in Long Beach, we're, we're a very city, city environment. So we have a lot of concrete in our, in our neighborhoods. And, you know, in Southern California itself, it doesn't rain. It definitely doesn't look like this, right? And so over time, there's so much trash that gets built up, so much pollution, maybe oil or extra dirt or trash that gets put on our streets. And then when it rains, guess what? All of that goes directly into our oceans, right? Now, there might be some pesticides to kill off some bugs or, you know, maybe some f extra fertilizer that gets also pushed down into those drains. And all of that pollution can get caught right here in our wetlands. Maybe if it's trash or maybe if it's any of those chemicals that go into our water, the, the plants and the soil and the roots will actually filter out a lot of those toxins, a lot of that pollution, and it'll filter out cleaner water back into the environment. So there's a lot of really cool things that these wetlands can do, all right? So with that, we do have a question that has popped in. Uh, where do wetland birds nest? And that was a great question, and that's going to actually uh, kick us off into our bird portion of our wetland talk. So uh, if you happen to have some binoculars, might be fun to kind of look for birds around. And we're going to be talking about some of those bird adaptations. So let's go ahead and maybe let's start with um, one of the birds that you might see either on the coastline, but also inland. So it's a bird that really kind of spans uh, different locations, geological locations. And that would be our um, either our bufflehead or our ruddy duck. I think the bufflehead is the picture that we, that we have. And so these are actual ducks. You may be familiar already with some ducks. Maybe you're familiar with a mallard duck or maybe Scrooge McDuck or maybe Launchpad McQuack, right, or Donald. Uh, but today our focus is going to be on the, uh, on the ruddy duck that we happen to have right here. Now, what's really cool about this bird, uh, it doesn't have, you know, millions of dollars like Scrooge or, you know, a, a land designated to itself like Donald, but it does have this really cool beak right here that is bright blue. And this is one that's actually found on a male, which is really cool during its prime mating season, right? When it wants to show off to all the ladies being like, I'm the best duck for you. Forget about Donald and Launchpad and everyone else. I'm the best fit, right? And so this, this duck right here uh, is showing off to, to all the lovely lady ducks. And who knows? Uh, Maybe one will be like, yes, please, I, I will. And so with these animals right here, though, they have the same kind of um, duck characteristics, right? So what do you notice right here? Now, if it doesn't have that top hat or the glasses or the monocle, but it does have that kind of wide-shaped bill, 
that we can see right here, right, that many ducks have. You can see that, oh, it's hard to see, but it has its paddle feet that are down here too as it walks. That's underneath the tail a little bit. I think you can, oh yeah, you kind of see a little bit right over here. And then of course it has that, that kind of low in the water, but still kind of very buoyant, right? Still kind of popping up and it can move around as it goes. And so these ducks, they also kind of have like a waterproofing layer on them too. So any thoughts to what kind of food this animal would eat having that wide bill, that wide duck bill? If it sits in the water, Yeah, right, maybe some, some smaller fish or maybe some insects, right? Some crustaceans, maybe some snails, right? So these are some different animals that these ruddy ducks can, can eat. They will eat any of those different types of animals, which is pretty exciting to be able to see. Oh, looks like, looks like James is doing something very exciting behind me. Oh, ah. Uh, Man, maybe we'll have to look closer with our binoculars to be able to see it. But for right now, right, it's pretty amazing that these ducks uh, are really able to live either on the coastline or either in the very middle, at least for, for the United States. Um, as long as there's water and a lovely food source, right, they can migrate to whatever part they might need to to be able to survive. Now, here's a nice video within our, oops, within our habitat. And there's a great picture of our ruddy duck. Oh, you can see those feet! Aren't they great? They're just kind of back there, just kind of hanging out as it floats, right? But what's really awesome about these feet is you can see how they're kind of wide. They're kind of paddly, right? They're definitely webbed. And so this, these are great feet that really help them to just kind of paddle along, maybe find that tasty fish, right? And like dive down to be able to get it or at least peck its head down to be able to grab that tasty crustacean, maybe that delicious water flea or any kind of insect that might be in the water as well, and really take advantage of anything that's living in or near the surface of the water. Or maybe if it's shallow enough, you know, they can peck in a little bit at the mud too. So very cool. Definitely one of my favorites for the beautiful colors that these ruddy ducks are. Now, because there are such a wide variety of food sources for these animals, uh, they have many different adaptations, right? Many different special features that really help that particular bird thrive. In our case, we saw the ruddy duck that really kind of floats along the very top, has short stubby legs that they use as paddles to kind of paddle along, and that really large wide bill that helps them to be able to scoop up a lot of those tasty foods. Well, Believe it or not, not all of our birds look that, uh, look that delightful. They come in many different forms. And so our next bird that we're gonna take a look at, let's see, will be maybe the American Avocet, please. And so with this bird, let's see what you notice about some similarities and differences between our Avocet that we see right here and that ruddy duck. So let me see here, hmm. Definitely see kind of that same rusty color, right? So that's kind of a theme that, that I notice is that they both kind of have that rusty reddish brown color. Almost reminds me of James's hair. That's back behind the studio, that kind of color. Um, looks a little bit darker though in their body type. But what's really interesting to me, at least that you could tell with this picture, are those beaks. Are they anything like the beaks that we saw with our ruddy duck? Quite different, yeah? Absolutely. So with it being super long and pointy, any thoughts to what they might eat or how they might even use their beak? Hmm. Do they use it to jabby stab their food? Hmm. Don't think so. Well, I think we have another video of another bird that kind of has a similar beak. This one, the avocet, is kind of upturned, but we have another one um, that's called a dowager. And so the dowager's beak is similar, but a little bit different. We can see it right here, right? It also is very long and pointy. And let's take a look at how it eats. I'm gonna move out of the screen for a little bit. Hmm, what do you notice? Interesting, it seems like it kind of opens up a little. Oh yeah, right? Oh, it's so cute. So what I'm seeing here with this bird is that it is just kind of, I mean, it's kind of 
stabbing it into the sand, right? Into that mud area right there. But what I think we also could kind of see in that video is that it actually is slowly opening up its beak a little bit, right? As it moves down. And so these animals are not just like stabbing in hopes to maybe like catch something. They are actively, let's watch it again. They're actively using that beak and they're grabbing things from that mud that we can see here. And they are opening their mouth and they're hum, 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 hum. they're bringing that food directly up into their mouth. Isn't that incredible? Such a long beak, but they're still able to open it up and to be able to grab any little delicious morsel that might be in there. So once again, kind of a similar food source, right? Maybe some worms, maybe some small crustaceans, right? Um, probably not fish, because it may be really tricky to be able to get fish with this kind of beak, but it's still really cool nonetheless, right? Now, it's also really great about this video is that we can also see its legs. Now, with the avocet, we couldn't see its legs because it was just kind of sitting down, right? But with our, um, with our dowager that we have right here, you can see that it has really kind of long, almost like stick legs right here. How do you think those stick legs help our animal out? Huh. What do you think? You're right, it's in water, right? So it definitely helps them to be able to maybe go in deeper. If they want to go deeper into the water, they can without getting their feathers wet, right? Because they're so up high. And so these animals are really awesome at being able to wade in the water to be able to, to maybe grab some food. Ah, now there is another bird too that actually is really great at wading in the water and will use its feet as lures. It's a popular one found much across America, and that would be the egret. We have a picture of our egret uh, that I believe James is trying to pull up at the moment. Um, and so I want you to see what telltale signs do you notice that help this animal to be able to wade in the water and kind of spear or try to really jab and get some fish. Do you see anything that might help it on its body? Yeah, those really long legs for sure. And that beak too. Now it's not, this beak isn't as long as the, the avocet or the dowager, right? That focuses on small things that you could scoop and get inside of that mud. But instead, this egret right here goes on ahead and it's able to catch fish. So it has that long neck. And this neck right now is kind of like pushed back, you know? but it can get really super long and it goes up and it kind of can bob and move as it goes slowly through the water like that. And as it moves, it's looking with its really good eyes to be able to see any kind of movement that's in the water. Now, egrets do come in two different flavors. You have your snowy egret and your great egret. And I forget which one, but one of them has bright yellow feet, right? They all both have the same color, the they both have the same color legs are kind of blackish but yeah i think it's a, it's a snowy egret that has the the yellow feet the great egret is also like much larger in size than the snowy egret snowy egrets are are a little bit smaller um but yeah for these egrets they have those bright white bright white bright yellow feet any guesses to what might be the point of having those really stocky black legs but then bright yellow feet hmm if you said to lure in some delicious fish, you are correct. So they will put their feet underneath the sand just a little bit and they will wiggle their little toes, right? And that will attract and bring in some curious fish that then can be eaten by our egret friend right here. So a pretty cool tactic, right? But we've seen a wide variety of different shapes so far. We've seen, you know, long beaks, short beaks, uh, bright toes, webbed feet, right? Uh, all sorts of different special features on these birds to be able to help them to live in a habitat such as a wetland. All right, now we've had a lot of questions coming in, so I'd like to address some of them. Thank you so very much for asking. Uh, Lorelai was asking, how do wetland birds catch their prey? Well, I'm hoping that maybe you can tell me that answer now, Lorelai, right? It definitely depends on that bird, but depending upon you know that bird type, 
check out its features, right? If we're thinking about that ruddy duck with that long bill, it could definitely scoop up some of uh, seeds that maybe have fallen into that water, maybe some um, different plants, right? Or some animals or crustaceans that live on top or insects. Ah, these are, this is a great little video of our avocets. Um, and so you can see, you can watch them even as a baby. We can watch them feed and see how, their, how they open up their little mouths and how they're able to kind of dig into that mud right there that helps them eat some of those critters that live in that mud, right? Some of those, uh, maybe a little bit of snails, maybe some small crabs, stuff like that. Something that's obviously also too very small to go into those bills, right? Very cool. Oh, I love these babies. They're so adorable. So Laurel, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for joining us. Also got another question from um, Minu of what is the largest animal in the wetland? That's a good question. You know, I think it maybe might might depend on the, the type of animal. If we're thinking like in the water or if we're thinking on land. There are some birds that get quite large. The great blue heron and uh, I know can at least get like five, five-ish feet tall or thereabouts, I think. Um, and so that's as big as me. I'm 5'4", five, maybe 5'5", five, five if I'm feeling really tall that day. But you know, that's a really pretty tall bird. Um, so that's definitely one of the larger ones. And so, ah, here's an awesome picture of one. It looks kind of small here, but it sounds like a pterodactyl. Now, not that I'm a dinosaur expert or know exactly what a pterodactyl sounds like, but I know that when I heard that bird, I was like, wait, is that a dinosaur, right? Because it sounds so like, rah, rah, so, so prehistoric-like that I didn't give it justice. But uh, th so these animals right here, of course, you know, are somewhat distant relatives, uh, but they are incredible predators, much like our egret, that really kind of has those long legs, so much so that you can see it go all the way back right here, um, and those long wings that help them to fly, and that really long beak too, right? So it helps them really to kind of wade and have their, their necks really long and look out into the water and move like this and then <laughs> grab their tasty food, right? And so it's an incredible predator and definitely one of the larger ones, at least here um, in our California wetland area. So, um, but depending upon the place in the world, I mean, there are definitely some larger animals that will live in wetlands aside from, from the great blue heron. So thank you for asking. And we also have another question. Do stingrays give birth to live young? And as a matter of fact, they do. Thank you for asking. So uh, rays right here give, uh, they have pups. So, and they have a few pups at a time. I don't recall the exact number, but like a handful of these little pups. And they're about a little bit bigger than a silver dollar when they come out. So they are absolutely adorable. They're one of my favorite animals, uh, baby animals here at the aquarium whenever we have pups. They're just like, uh, it's so incredibly delightful. But that's actually one way that you could tell the difference between a stingray and a skate. Those two can look very similar and are related, um, but uh, stingrays give live birth while skates actually lay eggs. And so that's one of the, the main differences between the two. Awesome. All right, folks, so we are just about out of time, but I just kind of want to recap a little bit about wetlands, right? So these magical places, these estuaries, swamps, marshes, wherever they may be, right, in your, in your area of the world, um, are really amazing places, right? They are wet, they have land, and they have tons and tons of foods, which is great for a wide variety of animals and different feeding strategies, like for our American avocet that we have here. Some of those really major features that we can look for on a particular um, bird in this case, maybe it's bills, right? Maybe looking at the bill of the, or, or the beak, sorry, the beak of our particular bird right here and the legs and maybe the shape of their body, right? Those might be some great telltale signs to help us know and help us at least have a guess to where it might live and what it might eat, right? So our avocet, again, with these really tall legs that help them to be able to wade through the water versus our ruddy duck, right? That had those really paddle-like feet that basically paddled through the water kind of like that, right? To be able to eat a lot of 
things on the very top of the water or maybe in shallow areas where they could get into the mud. But that is, we've just barely scratched the surface of how cool wetlands are, right? Uh, so definitely thank you so very much for joining us today. It's been really fun checking out birds with you. Now you can use those similar kind of thoughts, right? As you maybe look at some birds around your house. Now they may not, I mean, depending upon where you live, they may have those long necks if you live in a coastal or maybe near a lake. But otherwise, check out some of those features on some of your local birds, maybe your neighborhood. They too have special features on them that really help them to survive in, in the habitat that they live in with you. So pretty cool stuff. Once again, uh, thank you so very much for joining us. If you do have any questions, feel free to go on ahead and email us. But otherwise, I think I'm going to be spending the rest of my time bird watching in this lovely environment of the wetlands. Thanks everyone for joining us. Take care. Wow, look at that one over there. Incredible. Oh man. I think it is.